Most of you know me or have gotten to know me the last couple of days as the National Conference co-chair. Right now I'm wearing a second hat, the chairman of the National Water Task Force. And it is with great pleasure and honor that I'm standing up here today with this. We have a wonderful crew here and a wonderful panel. But first, it's well known that Israel has suffered from a severe water shortage for the past 70 years. With the very few natural resources and a minimum amount of rainfall, Israel, with the help of the Jewish National Fund, has still managed to meet the daily needs of all the Israeli citizens and to still build a large agricultural economy to feed its citizens. They have done this over the past 70 years with continued planning and innovation. But the bad news, our job is not done. It's just getting started. With a growing population, the water needs will continue to increase. This means that the planning and the work that we have done for the last 70 years must continue. We cannot wait until the tap runs dry to start trying to solve the problem. And today you will learn from this panel of experts on how we are going to accomplish this. So it's great pleasure that I introduce my vice chair, Bob Lemke, who is the president of United Water and Sanitation District in Colorado and is currently involved in developing water resources throughout the state. It's thanks to JNF's leadership in this area that Bob was drawn to us, and he has since become an extremely active member and a proud member of the World's Chairman Council. With that, Bob, my good friend, please come on up. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. You are indeed in for an interesting forum. First, I'd like to thank our very generous co-sponsors for their thoughtful leadership and support. Andrew J. Meyer of the Cornerstone Group, Morgan Stanley, and very importantly, Mark and Ellen Kelman. This afternoon, you're going to witness the great strides Israel and Jewish National Fund have taken together to help mitigate the many water challenges across the globe. The persistent issues that challenge Israeli farmers, education for the next generation, desalinization, delivering water across trans boundaries to underdeveloped communities, relevance to the United States' own water challenges and the ongoing need to build more reservoirs in Israel to help meet the future water needs of their growing population. Along the way, you'll see some great video footage and hear from the experts on the ground in Israel who would share their stories and experiences. Indeed, this is one of the most qualified panels to the, in the world all together at one time to discuss this fascinating and important subject. There's no doubt that Israel was successful in using its severe water, water disadvantage as a platform for incredible innovation. Israel has become a water superpower, yet still faces many challenges. So let's get right into it. To get us started, please welcome our MC for this hour, my friend Ben Perlman. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to the JNF's Water Plannery. My name is Ben Perlman and I'll be your host for this afternoon. I'm a proud member of the JNF's National Water Task Force and the president of Smart Water Group, an organization representing some of the leading water technology companies in Israel. Now, I've been a part of the Israeli water community for almost a decade now, having moved to Israel back in 2010. There, I was a first-hand witness to the innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurial spirit that has transformed Israel from a water-starved nation into a water superpower. 
It was there that I realized how integrated the Jewish National Fund was in the local water economy, leading the way through wastewater recycling, water drilling, river rehabilitation, education, and of course, reservoir construction. But the world is changing faster than ever before. Now, despite all of these historical advances and assistance from organizations like the JNF, Israel today is facing serious scarcity challenges related to water. Climate change, population growth, and a rising standard of living are all putting greater pressure on Israel's most critical natural resource. Israel, unsurprisingly, is not alone. The latest UN World Water Report predicts, and I quote, by 2025, 1.8 billion people are expected to be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity. And two thirds of the world's population could be under water stress conditions. 2025, that's only seven years from now. At a minimum, the world will face serious economic and political challenges from water scarcity. At a maximum, the world will face a grave humanitarian crisis. Hundreds of millions of people will, will suddenly find themselves in places where there once was water, but no longer is. Picture a world with entire regions displaced, massive food shortages, and serious challenges around basic sanitation. You may not feel it from the comfort of your home here in the US, but this is the future for many people around the world. However, there is a little country, a very dry country, in the middle of the driest region in the world that has developed some solutions to the water challenges of the world. That country, a country that's 60% desert, is Israel. Now, when it comes to water, Israel is the world standard in policy, governance, and management. This is a country that embraces innovation, empowers entrepreneurship, and prioritizes conservation of this invaluable resource, from the fields to the cities and inside the home. It's no surprise that drip irrigation was developed in Israel, a technology embraced by every farmer in the country. It also leads the world in water recycling, reusing almost 90% of its wastewater back to agriculture. In fact, the farmers prefer this over potable water. Today, around the world, 150 countries have some form of engagement with Israel over water. And that is a remarkable number because there aren't 150 countries with which Israel has diplomatic or commercial relations. Water is a way of engaging others. It's a pathway to peace. Today, Israel is entering its fifth year of severe drought conditions. Climate change, urbanization, population growth, and of course, the ever-present ever need for water security all force Israel to be more creative and innovative than ever before. Even Israel needs more water, now. I'm Yuval David, traveling around Israel with the Jewish National Fund USA, learning about Israel's issues with the drought and overall scarcity of water. The population of Israel has grown since 1948, the day of its establishment, from 600,000 people to over 8.5 million people today. Throughout this time, rainfall precipitation has decreased by more than 50%. Due to Israel's clever water management, Israelis still have water, but it's expensive and there's not enough. The population is still growing, as are its water needs. The amount of inflowing water to Lake Kinneret, it's the Sea of Galilee, is the lowest in the history. If the lake continued to recede, it would be a disaster. The line of the Kinneret was right there by all of these houses in the background. Now we're walking on what used to be deep underwater. Israel has entered its fifth year of a very serious drought. Its impact is seen at every single natural water resource, including here at the Kinneret. The water used to come up the house. Our children used to jump 
from the second floor into the water. People don't come as often as they used to come because the water is so far away, there were no fishes around. Something is changing in a very bad way. There is no water in Jordan. There is no uh, water in Syria. There is no water in Palestinian areas. The whole area is suffering for a very heavy drought. This is the Jordan River. It used to be Israel's main natural water resource. Some people might now call it a stream. And now, to begin our conversation, please join me in welcoming to the stage, all the way from the Arava in Israel, a farmer and pioneer, Noah Zer. Farming in Israel is not just a profession. Farming in Israel is an art form that has brought color and flavors to a once empty land. Farming is the continuation of the pioneering spirit and action of Zionists throughout the generations. Farming in Israel is also security. It is physical security because all of our farming regions were placed strategically on our borders. And it is food security, because farmers are Israel's food suppliers in case our borders close. I am Noazel, and my husband and I are proud farmers in Israel. We are part, thank you. We're part of a long tradition of Zionists who believe that Israel must make the desert bloom in order to survive and thrive. My husband's grandparents and my grandparents came to work the land of Israel long before there was a state of Israel. We continue the tradition of reclaiming our ancient homeland. When the desert and the need for agriculture clash, the result is making the impossible possible. My husband and I grow a few peppers in the desert, you could say, about two million every year. Thank you. Farmers in Israel have sensors in the ground that transmits information about soil fertilization, water, temperature, and humidity right to our phones. While many aspects of farming are adapting to the future, there are some challenges that we still face, largely because, well, we still live in the desert. We develop our own plan of what and how to grow based on a number of specific conditions. If the temperature is just one degree higher or lower than our projection for the month, it can change our entire yield, or worse, the ability to grow anything at all. Or, if water supply is low that year, then our water quota is reduced, and less water means fewer crops. Weather, arid soil, and water are main challenges, but there are others. As you saw, the, kiner the kineret has been shrinking for the past 40 years, straight prim primarily due to regional climate change and long-term decrease in rainfall in northern Israel. Fortunately, the public water supply is secured thanks to the construction of desalination plants that help reduce demand on the Kinneret. However, the drought has led to cuts in water allocation for agriculture. Less water means fewer crops. Less water means dry fields. Less water means less income. Less water means less jobs. And ultimately, less water means less people. In the very areas we need to grow communities. Fortunately, Jewish National Fund has been delivering on its vision of making the desert bloom for over 117 years. 
the ability to see into the future and tackle approaching problems is part of what makes JNF so special. Ten years ago, Jewish National Fund supported the construction of the Shamil Grill up north that today supplies 1.5 of Israel's water consumption, a true savior for farmers up north. In the south, there are similar chances, but also new ones. My fellow farmers on the border of Gaza are facing a wave of fire terror. Kites and balloons sent with burning explosives by terrorists in Gaza towards Israeli territory. They have lost more agricultural fields to fire than the entire area of the city of Tel Aviv. Over 10,000 football fields worth of crops. The Arava Valley, where I live in, is a very special place in Israel. It is a region of just 8,500 people and is 22% of the entire land of Israel. We live along the eastern border of Israel, without any fence or physical border between us and Jordan. Farming is the main source of income for all the families in the region. The natural soil in my region is bare, sandy, it doesn't properly hold water yet. The Arava is Israel's leading agricultural area. Crazy, right? How, you ask? We have developed a variety of solutions, like bringing in soil, using compost, but we still face the issue of enough water to properly cultivate the desert farmland we've been blessed with. Since the Arava Valley is not connected to the main water grid of Israel, most of our water comes from aquifer under the land, which is very salty. So we have to desalinate our water. Each community has a small desalination plant. Water in this region is not only limited by quality, but also by quantity. More than a government-issued quota per family, we have strict limits to when each family can use water, since the, the pressure wouldn't be strong enough if every family opened the faucet at the same time. The quota is so important that my children, Jonathan, who is five and a half, and Nama, who is one, they know we are allotted a quarter every year for water for the farm and for the house together. Jonathan, well, he's old enough to know not to use a lot of water during bath time, or for example, when he washes his hands, he knows to close the faucet while soaping up. We tell him, mommy and daddy needs the water for our peppers. We need more water, period. Challenges aside, farming in Israel is their rewarding life. We're passionate business owners fighting for the success of our country. There is a solidarity spirit among us because everyone is an entrepreneur, living on and making a living off the land. More than that, we are pioneers, modern day Zionists, continuing the work of our forefathers, building the land, making a difference, and fulfilling the Zionist dream. We are honored to have Jewish National Fund as our partners in this Zionist mission. From water reservoirs, to wastewater treatment plants, to cutting edge R&D centers, to educating students from Africa and Asia in modern agricultural techniques that they can bring back home, you do not leave any stone unturned when it comes to working with us, making our lives better, and most importantly, making the desert bloom. For generation, Jewish National Fund has supported farmers like me to build the land of Israel. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. To friends, to family, to life. L'chaim.
Thank you, Noah. Let's give her all a round of applause, please, please. At the JNF, we recognize the power of education to affect great change. In Israel, we support initiatives focused on the future water conservation and innovation by educating the next generation of Israelis of all backgrounds. This includes the Stockholm Junior Water Prize for high schoolers and the Rainwater Harvesting Program, an ongoing conservation effort in over 60 elementary schools across the country. Here's a short look at this amazing program in action at a Bedouin school here in the Negev. Welcome. We are very glad to have you here at the Ferdows yeah. School. We have 520 pupils here. So you have a rainwater harvesting system and use the water for what? We have here the water system that help us to catch the rain and then to reuse it in different ways uh, without wasting any drop of water. We have water pipes and pumps that bring the water from the water storage containers and bring it to the roof and then goes into cleaning procedure and then they are gonna using the water for bathrooms and gardens and plants. It's the basic source for being alive, water. So in the future, because of the lack in Israel here in water, we need to save water, and this is one of the ways that we can save and recycle water and use it one more time. Everything that we do in our school uh, that relates to the environment, we are also discussing this with the other uh, neighborhood here. So everything that you teach in this school yeah. doesn't only stay in the school, but it goes out yeah. into the rest of the community. We're going to sit as an example for other schools also to influence the entire society here. We have water, but uh, we don't have enough water. I'm speaking here with these wonderful children who, from first grade to sixth grade, have already learned how to reduce and reuse and recycle water. These children are our future. They're taking the knowledge that they learn here and take it home to teach their parents and their communities how to do the same thing. I think that's just amazing. You can see how something so simple as water can have such a profound impact on a child's understanding of the natural world. Now let's look at what can happen 20 years after you've piqued a child's curiosity and passion for water. Here are a few of the leading Israeli water technologies improving the world around us. Irrigation, the gold standard in agriculture comes from Israel. This all started with Netafim, a company that began in Kibbutz Hatzarim, just outside of Be'er Sheva, has developed into a global leader in precision irrigation. Precision irrigation helps farmers tackle the challenges of drought, evaporation, salinization, groundwater depletion, by delivering water and nutrients straight to the roots of each plant. Simply put, this technology improves crop profitability by using less while yielding more. Today, Netafim has a global presence with over 4,300 employees across 110 countries. Their solutions have irrigated over 22 million acres of land for more than 2 million ambitious farmers. And they are not the only ones who recognize the need for sustainable humanitarian developments in water technology. Some of you might be familiar with this machine. This is WaterGen. They see access to fresh drinking water as humanity's biggest challenge, but they're solving the problem in a very different way. WaterGen's innovation taps into an unlimited natural resource all around us, air. Using an ultra-efficient dehumidification technology, WaterGen water provides portable, clean drinking water to emergency responders around the globe. 
Watergen has already been used by the American Red Cross and FEMA, providing immediate water relief to the citizens of Texas and Florida in the aftermath of Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. Watergen, like Netafim, is leading the Israeli water revolution, providing affordable water to those in the greatest of need. Another prime example of innovation in this space is Phytech, an Internet of Things company leveraging the power of smart sensors, big data, and artificial intelligence to create a world of smart farms. The data they collect provides meaningful alerts and recommendations to farmers around the globe, continuously improving their use of water. Now, these are just a few of the amazing water technologies coming out of Israel, but there are new developments emerging every single day. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is it about Israel that has brought about this leadership position in water? Well, let me try and put this in perspective. First, it's important to understand that Israel's unique geopolitical and social circumstances has shaped the country into the startup nation, a hub of dreamers, innovators, and entrepreneurs. Some credit must go to the IDF, the most innovative army in the world, whose programs expose young Israelis to cutting-edge technologies and provide them with the tools and experience to launch their own startups. And the IDF recognizes the strategic importance of water as a basic priority for peace and survival in a very rough neighborhood. This is a different kind of survival with the same common denominator, water. Now, you combine these two forces together with strong governance, realistic water pricing, the right business incentives, and you have a perfect environment for innovation. Today, the world is saving billions of dollars in decades of R&D, leveraging the know-how and the technology Israel has brought to the global community. Now, without a doubt, one of the most important water technologies implemented at scale in Israel is desalination. This is a membrane technology which removes salt from seawater, producing affordable drinking water all along the Mediterranean coast. We spoke to Hilla Gill, uh, head of desalination at Israel's Water Authority, and Ronan Wolfman, CFO and director of Hutchison Water, about desalination. Take a look. Thanks to the five desalination plants in Israel, Israeli faucets have water. We're standing here in the Solek desalinization plant, which is the largest desalinization plant, not only in Israel, but in the world. You were saying that two kilometers that way is yeah. the ocean, where the water comes into the plant and goes through multiple stages to eventually be used as potable drinking water. We are actually cleaning the seawater on this area in order that the water that will face later on the membrane are completely clean and clear. We need that the water through that uh, process of treatment will be completely clear in order that the membrane will not clog later on when we are pushing the water through that membrane in order to take out the salt from the water from the sea. We have uh, five major desalination plants in Israel. The first one was in uh, Ashkelon. The second one is just here in Palmachim. The third one was uh, on Chedera. The fourth one is here in Sorek. And the fifth is in Ashdod. All together, we have the ability to produce 585 uh, million cubic meters per year. It's 40% of all the water, the potable water that is the Israeli sector needs in a year just from the desalination plants That's in Israel, amazing. and just in 13 years, it's a revolution. It's not uh, less than a revolution in the water sector of Israel. Our natural resources are declining, and our need and demand are raising, so the solution will be more desalinated plants and use more treated wasted water for agriculture. If we want to solve problems, in five years from now, we need to work now because it takes five to six years until we'll get the first cu cubic meter from the, the new desalination plants.
And now, please welcome to the stage from the Arava Institute in Israel, Dr. Clive Lipshin. <laughs> Is that for me? It looks like you need it, Ben. Yeah, it's a thirsty job <laughs> up here. You aren't the only one who's thirsty, Ben. The world is thirsty, and there's more to that bottle of water than meets the eye. Water is the most fundamental resource for everything. Not only can we not survive without it or run an economy without it, but unlike many resources, we can't replace it. But there's even more to it than that. There's the bottle itself, how the bottle got here how the water got in the bottle, and who treated the water to ensure it was clean and safe for us to drink. It's a bit more complicated than meets the eye. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, can you tell us more about the issue in water in Israel and why you focus on it? Of course. To start with the basics, Israel is a small country whose most significant sources of water are transboundary. That means that much of the water used in Israel originates from water sources that we share with our neighbors. This makes water in Israel more than an engineering challenge it's also a political challenge. Part of sustainably managing this resource is sharing the resource, and this is difficult because we are often in disagreement with our neighbors. This is not like the US and Canada, for example, that share the waters of the Great Lakes. This is Israel and Syria sharing the water of the Jordan River, which feeds the Sea of Galilee or the Kinneret. In fact, the basin of rivers and water that includes the Kinneret includes Israel, Syria, Jordan, and even Lebanon. There is also a large underground aquifer that is mostly under the West Bank that Israel shares with the Palestinians. We live in a desert environment where water is a scarce commodity. All of our neighbors are in a similar situation, so a solution to water scarcity can mean a step towards solving regional disagreements. Part of my success in building transboundary water partnerships has been establishing a network, a dialogue and relationships with like-minded professionals on the other sides, as it's crucial for Israel to ensure access to clean and healthy water resources for everyone. So what kind of work is being done today with the Palestinians? One of the biggest challenges we face in Israel is cross-border sewage. You know the saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure? Well, with sewage, one man's trash is another man's public health crisis. Let me explain. The Palestinians' capacity to treat sewage meaning to put sewage into a network of pipes to then clean it and reuse it, is very low. They are behind at each stage of the process. Because they have no proper way of dealing with sewage, it often flows from them into Israeli territory and creates a public health risk because sewage is a vector for disease. So while the problem is theirs, it's also ours. We started a project a few years ago at the Arava Institute in partnership with JMF to find out how the sewage from Hebron the largest Palestinian city, is discharged and makes its way into the Beersheba River. Why, you may ask? Think about it. For over a decade, JNF is leading the restoration of the Beersheba River and is now building a lake by the river that will use recycled water. Doing this, JNF has changed the landscape of Beersheba. But the water that runs into that river comes from the West Bank via Hebron, so we must treat that water too. Part of solving the sewage problem is understanding the quality or how polluted the water is. We are researching this now and designing solutions together with our neighbors and, of course, with the help of JNF. Yeah, I mean, it sounds amazing and obviously very complex. Um, can, you, can you tell us about any other water projects that are significant to achieving clean water in Israel? So there is one project in particular that is very important to the quality of water in Israel that I've been working on with the JNF. We are working to improve the wastewater treatment in the Bedouin population in the Negev. The Bedouins are a minority population that mostly live in the Negev, and many do not have access to basic services, including sewage treatment. There are no sewage pipes in these Bedouin villages because they aren't connected to a sewer grid, so the sewage doesn't disappear down some network of pipes, but gets dumped into big holes outside of the houses, what we will call cesspits. These cesspits are a risk to both the environment and the population, because the sewage is not being treated. The sewage seeps into the aquifer, polluting it. With the help of Jewish National Fund, we are working to adopt and implement technology that treats sewage autonomously in these communities. This type of small-scale community wastewater treatment technology helps them recycle water, use it for agriculture, and keeps the groundwater aquifers safe and secure. 
It's a win-win for everyone. This, by the way, is similar to issues you have right here in Arizona with the residents of the Navajo Reservation, for example, many of whom are also not connected to the sewer grid and are looking for solutions. Let me just finish with one thought, Ben. Water can be a catalyst to peace, and from my experience, is a conduit to peace. I want to thank you and JNF for helping bring peace on a small scale to the region. Thank you, Clive. Let's give Clive a big round of applause, please. All right. Our next guest joins us all the way from, well, uh, right here in Arizona. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Sharon Megdow. Hiya, Sharon. I must have missed that dress code memo. Tell us about that shirt you're wearing. Hi, Ben. Well, I thought I'd wear one of my University of Arizona shirts. Hey, go Wildcats! <laughs> Arizona's where I've been living for the past 40 years, and water is what I've been working on for almost 30 of those years, the last 16 plus of them at the university's Water Resources Research Center. Okay, so I understand you're a PhD economist trained at Princeton University working out in the desert, water, in Arizona. Tell us more. Of course. My work primarily focuses on water policy, specifically helping people understand water resource challenges and the solutions to address them. Now, you may be asking yourself, Ben, how does someone from Arizona connect as I have with Israel? You took the words right out of my tongue. So what, what do Israel and Arizona have in common when it comes to water? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> the challenges are vast, and the list of similarities is extraordinary. Here are just some of them. Both areas face drought conditions and share a desire for potable water of the highest quality. Both face new demands due to growing economies and populations. Importantly, Israel and Arizona both share borders with other nations and regional water users. As Arizona and Israel have each developed successful water strategies that have been internationally recognized, it is important to advance collaboration, ensuring that our desert economies will continue to grow and thrive for generations to come. So tell us, how did you become interested in Israel's water challenges and, and solutions? Well, Ben, there is a story, but I'll keep it short. Uh, recognizing these similarities after my second visit to Israel in 2006, I organized a workshop held here in Arizona that brought together water management experts from Israel and this region to explore these common challenges and approaches to addressing them. Since 2010, I've been to Israel a dozen times. In 2011, National JNF board member Joe Hess helped arrange two days with JNF. That visit helped educate me a lot. It is so important to see things on the ground each time I visit a water site, I learn. You'd be surprised at how often I'm asked to share my knowledge about Israel's water management. The world, and specifically the US, is very interested in learning about Israel's experience and success with water management, especially desalination. In the US, we have not generally been able to successfully deploy large-scale desalination plants like they've done in Israel. And let me clarify that technology of desalination is not only rele relevant to seawater, but also to highly saline groundwater, so it can be used for drinking and other uses like they've done successfully in the Arava Valley. So what else can we learn about Israel's experience in water? Well, first is the use of recycled water. Israel leads the world in water recycling. About 50% of the water used by agriculture in Israel is reclaimed water. And JNF reserv reservoirs are so very important to this use. In the US, people still have questions about using recycled water for food crops. Israel's experience is very important for regions struggling with water scarcity across the globe. Israel also leads in water consciousness. 
In Israel, people simply use less water because they've been educated to do so from a young age. Public campaigns by Israel's Water Authority have done a lot towards educating the public about water scarcity and the need for water conservation. And JNF shows tremendous leadership here. As you've discussed, Israel is clearly seen as a world leader in development of new water technologies. And there is much opportunity for the U.S. water sector to utilize Israeli technology. So, Sharon, tell us, what is the future of water management and this ongoing relationship between your region and Israel? I'm confident that the connections will be strong and meaningful. In fact, in December alone, I'm involved in two programs to connect Arizona and this region to Israeli water innovations. There will continue to be great opportunities for those involved in water to go to Israel to appreciate the innovations and learn from the water conservation mechanisms that are so successful. In addition, as president of the International Arid Lands Consortium, for which JNF is a major sponsor, thank you, I am involved in exploring problems and solutions that improve the lives of people living in the arid and semi-arid regions of the world. And lastly, I'm excited to say that Jewish National Fund is spearheading a joint effort between the University of Arizona and the Aravet Valley to build the JNF Joint Institute for Global Food, Water, and Energy Security to find solutions for developing countries, especially Africa. <laughs> and I, along with several others from my university, are are traveling to the Arava in less than one month. Uh, I'd like to close by noting that water should be seen as a bridge, not only something that must be bridged. A lot can get done when people collaborate on finding water solutions, and I'm proud to be collaborating with JNF, Israel, and many, many others. Wow. Thank you so much, Sharon. <laughs> Sharon Megdal, everyone. Woo! All right, so let's take one more look at the challenges farmers in Israel are facing today. We're lowering this apparatus down under the ground to see if we can find water there. We're waiting for a siren to go off. JNF USA is here in Chalutza, helming the water drilling deep down into the aquifers to tap into the water that's necessary to create an agricultural oasis in the middle of this desert. What we're doing here, we're growing a hydroponic lettuce that the water runs in the tunnel. The greens are just sitting inside and growing. This system is a recycling system. We save water by the system. We came here, there was only sand. I'm here walking amongst the greenhouses of Chalutza. Even though it looks like a massive agricultural success, they've still had their challenges. They are not connected to the national water grid. They get all of their water from a desalination plant in Ashkelon. That means water is much more expensive. What type of oranges are these? Uh, these are uh, Valencia. So all of this is thanks to the recycled water that comes here and you use to be able to grow these really tall trees. What are all these fruit doing on the ground? I drop them down in order that the tree will live with the less water. You're picking fruit off the tree and throwing it away because yeah. what? You don't have enough water for both the fruit and the tree? Yeah, exactly. You're telling me you came to the Negev with a Zionist dream. I came to the Negev to make it bloom. And uh, because we don't have enough water, that's what you see, you know. We are here and uh, now we, we, we close many, many... You had to water. shut down farms and you yeah. shut down your farm here. Why? Because we don't have enough water.
all my kids grew up in the fields. We all see that growing for your country is beautiful and it's important. If we would have enough water, we could feed our own people. Our last speaker you've already met. Please welcome back to the stage, Bob Lemke. Uh, hello again. I'm a native Coloradan, so that's where I'm going to start. Our state capitol building in Denver has panels in the rotunda with a poem from our first state poet laureate, Thomas Hornsby Farrell. The opening words of that poem are simply, here is a land where life is written in water. That is also the story of Israel. Colorado is a beautiful state, known for its mountains and high rivers, but we're also a high desert state like much of Israel. Colorado averages about 15 inches of water a year, more in the mountains, but much less on what is known as the Great American Desert. Israel can get up to 43 inches in the northern areas of the north, but less than one inch down on the Arava. As with Israel, managing scarce water resources and creative methods of use and reuse have been part of the Colorado experience since before we were a state. I've spent the last 20 years developing water supplies reservoirs, pipelines, recharge sites and the like for the growing communities of northern Colorado. And I found there's much we can learn from the state of Israel. Now, I'm not Jewish. So why do I find Israel and my dear friends throughout the country so energizing? In 2011, I was introduced to Israel when I agreed to sponsor a trip for Colorado legislators. I, I wasn't expecting much, just sort of another trip I sponsored. but. I read heavily and I prepared for the mission. I thought I knew what I was going to see, but I wasn't ready for what I experienced. During those first 10 days in Israel, I was energized by the can-do attitude that I saw everywhere and by the warmth, enthusiasm, and love of the people I met. I came to realize that the national motto could easily be, we'll figure it out. <laughs> this December, I'll be making my eighth trip in the last eight years to... <laughs> this will figure it out attitude is present particularly, as you've heard, in the way that Israel has identified and addressed its water needs. However, the ability to continue to absorb the diaspora from around the globe, the ability to provide dignity and work to an entire population Indeed, the ability to hold the land for future generations is dependent on the development of stable water supplies. Strong armies can protect and defend lands, but only farmers like Noah can build and make the land a nation. The water situation in Israel is critical and requires continued concerted efforts to provide the foundation for the next generation. Let's look at the reality. Israel's in the Middle East, as we all know. That's a tough neighborhood and a really dry one at that. Throughout the years, agriculture has moved from the wet north and central areas of Israel to the south. And despite this move to more arid areas, innovations in irrigation and farming techniques have increased the net agricultural output 1,100% above that which was in 1960 on the same land using the same amount of land using the same amount of water, 11 time fold. <laughs> but as you've heard, Israel is in an extended drought. The current drought's been going on for five years. In 2001, the water levels in the Canaret were 214.87 meters below sea level. The Water Authority defined that as a black line below which there's a risk of significant and more importantly, permanent environmental damage. No pumping is to occur below this level. 
If water levels were to drop below this point, there is a concern that the water pressure from the lake would be insufficient to hold back the salinity from nearby aquifers. And with the intrusion of salt, the historic Canaret could be permanently and irretrievably damaged. On October 17th, last week, the water levels in the lake were only at 214.51 meters below sea level, about 14 inches above the black line, and they were dropping about an inch a week. Fortunately, the rains typically come in late October. Now, you haven't read much about this. Why hasn't this extended drought brought Israel to the brink of panic? And as you know, there's a few key factors at play. Since 2005, as you've heard, with the opening of the Ashkelon desalination plant, and Israel has opened five major desal plants to convert seawater to drinking water, replacing almost entirely the water historically used from the Canaret. Indeed, now the majority of water used in Israel is from desalinated, recycled, or brackish water. The increased production from desalinization plants, which can take seawater amazingly and make it drinkable in 90 minutes, has allowed the urban areas of Israel to grow with the knowledge of their long-term water security. One may think that desalinization can solve the entire problem, but as you heard, that's not the case. It's extremely limited as to both cost and geography. There's another part of the water equation, the recycled water to support the vital agricultural needs of the sector rely on treated wastewater that's produced year round. However, our farmers only need the water during the growing season. That means that reservoirs are essential to capture treated wastewater and storm flows during the agricultural low use season. The strategic cycling and recycling and storage of water for use in agriculture is one of the greatest accomplishments of the Jewish National Fund. To date, JNF has aided in the construction of over 250 reservoirs, shown as orange dots on the map behind me. These reservoirs serve as a final stage in the water treatment cycle and hold a total of 66 billion gallons of recycled water and storm runoff for agricultural use. These existing reservoirs have increased the available water in the nation by over 15%. They provide more than half of the water used in the agricultural sector, and this frees up enough water for urban use by 4.4 million people, about half of the Israeli population. <laughs> the job's not done, however. As the urban areas of Israel blessedly continue to grow, there will be an increased need for treated water, store treated water for increased agricultural use. Currently, about 85% of the municipal water is reused. That's great. The highest in the world by far. Spain, by comparison, is about 17%. That's the number two country. And the United States, for the most part, is about 5%. Now, we do better here in Arizona and Colorado, but throughout the US, we rarely reuse our water. Our goal is to now increase this reuse in Israel to 95% by building 90 more reservoirs across Israel. Those are the white dots behind me. You can see that the plans extend from the north along both the coast and the Jordan River well down into the areas of the Gaza envelope and south of Beersheba. The government of Israel recognizes the importance of this task. Generally, about 70% of the cost of reservoirs is supported by government or water system grants. However, the remaining 30% must be raised from donations and community investments from us. I know we'll achieve this, Jewish National Fund, you, like the people of Israel, don't see obstacles. We see challenges that are met with vision. That's why this boy from Colorado fell in love with Israel. That's why I'm in love with the Jewish National Fund, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And thank you to Noah, Clive, and Sharon for joining us today. Please give them all one more round of applause. Friends, for over a hundred years, 
the Jewish National Fund has been Israel's strategic partner, transforming the land into a vibrant, blooming country, a place that all Israelis can be proud to call their home. The JNF remains committed to this vision of growth, prosperity, and peace, but there's a lot of work to do, and we need your help. Water, as you've learned, is the key to sustaining this growth and improving the lives of the communities who work so hard to fulfill Ben-Gurion's dream. Please join us by supporting any of the JNF water projects you've seen today, from water drilling, wastewater recycling, desalinating groundwater, educating students on conservation, transnational water solutions, and of course, building reservoirs in the desert. Every drop is important. Israel needs more water, and the Jewish National Fund needs your help. Thank you. Let's recognize our speakers for an unbelievable, inspiring, and really important presentation. Okay, my name is Harold Kaplan. Um, I'm a member of the JNF uh, Water Task Force. I'm also a proud member of the uh, President's Society and the Century Council. And I'm also a VP for the exciting area of administration and compliance at JNF. You can join the task force later. <laughs> okay. Um, any rate, um, on, your, on your seats were flyers for a really exciting opportunity that you have to take what you've learned today and hopefully been inspired with and go forward and, maybe, and uh, go on a tri trip with Bob Lemke and some others called the um, Israel H2O Tour which is going to occur in December 10th through December 17th, where you get to see on site the issues and the developments in the water area. And it should be a really wonderful uh, trip. Anyway, you, the, the flyers are on your seat. Uh, now, um, the, we have a couple of minutes before the next sessions, which are from uh, 3.30 to 415. Uh, two, two, two concurrent sessions are going on. The first is the Blueprint Negev from vision to fruition uh, right, right. and what comes next. That should be in the Frank Lloyd Wright rooms, salons H, I, and J. The second is, the go, is go North, building the Galilee for the 21st century and beyond and that should be in the Frank Lloyd Wright Salon, A, B, and C. Anyway, thank you all for coming to this presentation, and again, it was great. 